Welcome back everyone. My name is Dharmadi Komo. Welcome to another session uh, on SQL Server 2014. Today we're focusing on the hybrid cloud scenarios. And today I'm very glad to be joined by Sung here from Engineering. Sung, um, we talked earlier before this session and um, you, you tell me that you're going to share something weird, <laughs> some mind-bending stuff. Uh, so tell us what you're going to share today. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sung. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about SQL Server data files in Windows Azure. So let me first introduce myself a little bit. I am a program manager. I've been in SQL Server for around eight years now. Um, I've worked in various spaces in SQL Server, including the security space, where we worked on some encryption technologies, including transparent data encryption. I've also worked in high availability, so I've done some work with the SQL Server failover clustering. And I've also worked in the virtualization space, so I wrote uh, a consolidation white paper for SQL Server using virtualization technologies. Um, and I'm currently working on uh, SQL Server running in Windows Azure infrastructure services, which is SQL Server running in a Windows Azure virtual machine. Um, so a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll give you a brief uh, description of the technology. We'll talk about some of the scenarios, and then I'll show you how to use it. So SQL Server data files in Windows Azure, um, it's a kind of a new and interesting technology. You might be familiar with having your uh, music files or your video files streamed from your internet. Well, SQL Server data files in Windows Azure lets you stream your database files and your log files from the internet to either your on-premise SQL Server instances or your SQL Server instances running in Windows Azure virtual machines. What this allows you to do is uh, it lets you create and, create and place your database and log files directly in Windows Azure storage. Now, why would you want to use Windows Azure storage? Windows Azure Storage provides you with nearly bottomless storage. Um, you can use you know, many, many terabytes for pretty cheap. And you don't have to manage it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to maintain it. We produce replicas for you. We maintain um, high availability of that data for you. So you can place your data on there and not have to worry about any of the administrative costs or any of the maintenance costs that are typically associated with maintaining data and storage. We, of course, protect you from loss. Um, and we can uh, persistently uh, provide this to you. The other things that we provide you for is it provides you with some basic disaster recovery capabilities. So, uh, for example, if you have your SQL Server instance running in a uh, East US environment, you can actually have your data located in West US or maybe in another continent. So if anything should happen to your SQL Server instance running in East US, you can simply reattach a new instance and have data running again in your other environments. Wow. So hang on for a second. Sure. So you're talking about putting my data files and my log files from my SQL Server in Azure storage while my SQL Server is still running on-prem? Yeah, that's right. This is counterintuitive. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> it is. It does sound counterintuitive at the beginning. Uh, if you first think about it, having your SQL Server and your database files not collated, not collated located together <laughs> seems uh, weird and seems a little bit odd. Um, but I think there are certain situations where uh, this could be useful to you. Uh, for example, if you need to rapidly move your data from location to location, you can actually have your SQL Server um, instance running anywhere, and your data is always in the same place. So anywhere where your SQL Server is running, you can simply then just reattach the data that's running in the cloud, and you can be good to go. In addition, you separate your concept of compute and storage. So uh, because your compute and storage are separated, this lets you, um, you know, up upgrade your compute at your leisure and still have the storage still be in the same place and you know you can connect to it at any time. Wow. Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, I am, I'm sure our audience have the same questions. Um, <laughs> I have two questions uh, that pops in my mind. The very first one is, how about performance? That's a great question. So if you actually are running a SQL Server within the Windows Azure virtual machine itself, performance is actually not too bad. Um, as you know, if you run SQL Server in Windows Azure virtual machine, all of your data gets stored into Windows Azure storage anyway. Um, so all of the local disks are actually backed by Windows Azure storage. So the performance in that uh, scenario is actually pretty equivalent, and in some cases maybe a little bit better, uh, because you're directly talking to the Windows Azure storage backend. If you're running on-premise, however, um, you will experience some network latency, 
And so your performance is probably going to be a little bit worse than what you are used to and what you may experience. Uh, again, but you know, this very much depends on how you set up your environment, how you set up your network, and how you have set up your storage. Um, you likely will be, uh, have lower latency, however, which means that your I.O. will be slower. So if you were to use SQL Server data files in Windows Azure with an on-premise instance, you probably want to fine-tune your workload, maybe pick something that's not as I.O. intensive, uh, or is primarily read workloads rather than having a lot of write workloads. So test the latency first, I guess that's the... the uh, yeah, exactly uh, right. Test the latency before trying this thing. Okay, um, the other question that I have is the security, right? Everybody's yeah. thinking about security, like why would I want to put uh, data files in Azure? Yeah, that's a great question. Right. Uh, you know, like database files are usually particularly sensitive. You might have personal information, you might have financial information on there. Uh, your data is protected in several different ways. First, Windows Azure Store itself provides a mechanism for securing your data. So there's this concept of these storage access keys. And you have to have a storage access key to even access this data in the first place. So somebody without the storage access key cannot access it at all. Additionally, you can use several mechanisms within SQL Server to protect your data. Um, you can choose to use our various encryption options. We have both granular encryption, which is using our built-in functions to encrypt cell by cell, or you can take advantage of transparent data encryption. In both of these cases, the beauty of using this is that you actually have your keys wherever your SQL Server instance is. So if you still are on-premise, all of your keys and all of your decrypted data stay with you on-premise. Uh, but when they actually get stored into Windows Azure Storage, they are fully encrypted. So they are encrypted before it gets sent over, and they get encrypted at rest. So all of your data in Windows Azure Storage itself is fully encrypted, and you only have decrypted data when you actually are on your SQL Server instance. Wow, so I can store my key or certificate on-prem, making sure that I kept that safe while I'm putting the data in Azure. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, um, I'm sure you tested this with a um, number of customers, uh, early adopters, things like that. Um, can you share with us what are the common scenarios? I'm sure they all want to sure, know. Sure, sure. Let's actually walk through one of the scenarios. So okay. I have here, uh, you know, you have your basic setup. You have a uh, machine, let's call it Node 1. This machine could either be running in Windows Azure, vir uh, Windows Azure Virtual Machine, or it could be running on-premise. And you have your SQL Server installed on it. Of course, you have your Windows as a storage. And let's say now you've created an account with it and you create a container. So this gray box represents a container within Windows as your storage belonging to your storage account. On your SQL Server instance itself, you create what we call a credential. This credential stores your um, access information. Remember we talked about that special key that you can use to access the Windows as your storage container. Your credential stores that key in there. And now you create a database. So the database is logically on your SQL Server instance, but it is physically stored on Windows Azure Storage. Now, um, because it's on Windows Azure Storage, we have multiple replicas of that data for you. So as you can see here, we have now replicated that data three times. So in case if there's any sort of uh, error or media decay or anything, we have that protected for you. Let's say something happens. So this goes to your question, Damardi. What's the scenario here? Let's right. say that instance goes away. There's a disaster that occurs. That machine melted. You know, who knows what happened to right. it? And it just disappeared. Now, you can actually create a whole new instance somewhere safe, hopefully. You have another machine. Let's call it Node 2. You have SQL Server back on that machine again. And you do the same thing. You create that credential that we previously created. And now all you have to do is issue an attach command to the existing data that you have on Windows Azure Storage. And it's working, and it's up and running, and you have that, uh, that, that node and SQL Server back up and available and in production relatively quickly. As soon as you can set up that instance, you can attach it, and you're back to where you were before. So it saved me time from even like restoring for my backup, because this is just a simple attach operation. It, exactly. Not only does it save you time, it potentially gives you a better recovery point objective, because your SQL Server instance was live at the time that you know, it potentially went down, and all the data was being you know, immediately stored in Windows Azure Storage. When you get your new server back up and running, you are actually back at that point where that previous server went down, because you know, all that data was live stored on Windows Azure Storage. Okay. Um, Another question just popped in my mind. Sure. Um, how about uh, the pricing? You know, we have the data files in Azure. 
the database is running 24 7 does it mean that every transaction that I send there, I need to get charged by Azure? Is that what it is? Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. So there's two, uh, there's two costs that you'll incur by using these, this, this feature. Mm -hmm. So the first is the actual storage of the data itself. So you pay per gigabyte that's stored on there. So if you store 100 gigabytes, you'll pay for the 100 gigabytes. Transaction-wise, uh, any transactions that, that are within the Windows Azure boundary, you don't pay for. So that's just part of our feature. You don't have to pay for any transactions on there. So if you actually were running within the Windows Azure environment and you had a Windows Azure virtual machine, then your costs, uh, you basically just pay for storage at that point. If, however, you were to be using on-premise, like we were talking about, then you would pay at a per transaction. Each time you initiate a transaction, you do pay a cost. This is very low, though. We anticipate that transaction costs are you know, several cents per month for a relatively small database that's not running very often. Okay. So, that makes sense. Okay, so I'm slowly kind of understand what this scenario is all about. Sure. Um, is it really hard to configure this thing, or how is it? Is it very complex? That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, it's actually very easy to configure. All you have to do, basically, is you create a credential, as you can see here, create a credential with your key information that's stored in the credential. After that, use it just like you would use any other DDL statement. So basically, you would you know you use create database, you use create backup. Any of those statements are exactly the same as before. The only difference is that instead of the local path, you would use the uh, URL to your Windows Azure storage account, and it's that easy and very little changes. In fact, you most likely won't even need to make any application level changes because all you all you need to do is have pre-created this credential. Um, and then, of course, you know, change any, any of the relevant uh, file path strings. And you're back up and running, and it's working. And you can use, uh, you know, use it as if it's any other database stored any other, other, other location. And in fact, it'll look like any other database in terms of usage and in terms of how you access it and uh, how everything is uh, stored and, and you know, used. So it's very simple. It looks like it's very simple. It's just like regular create um, database. Uh, plus, I don't need to change my application. Right, yeah. In that sense, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Awesome. Can you show us how, how it actually runs? Sure, absolutely. So I have this environment created. So you can see here, I have a SQL Server instance um, that's up and running. Uh, on here, I'll go through all the steps of creating a brand new, uh, create brand new database with all of its data files stored in Windows Azure Storage. So you'll see here, the first thing that we need to do is actually create the credential that contains the information that you have, uh, the, the SAS key. So as you go, I'll run it, and I'll give you a quick idea of what this looks like. So you can see here, I actually have two credentials in the system currently. The first one is, you may have previously seen a um, previous session talking about the backup to Windows Azure. So there's a credential here for using backup to Windows Azure. Very similar concept. Um, and then you'll see here, there is the credential that we just created for using the data files on Windows Azure. You can see the name of it is the actual um, URL and the path. And you can say, see that we specified it as a shared access signature. Um, can you talk about shared access signature a little bit? Like, what is that? And I, I saw there's a secret. Uh, thing over there. Yeah, yeah. How do you get that, and how do you, you know, obtain that from Azure? Yeah, great point. Um, so the, there are actually two types of storage keys in Windows Azure. There's what is called a shared storage key, and there's a shared access signature key. The shared storage key is actually kind of like an admin key. So um, you may be already familiar with using it, because backup to Windows Azure uses the shared storage key. This basically gives you full control over your storage account. The shared access signature key is a granular key. What it means is that it allows you to have a more granular access to the container that you created and that you specified. So you're allowed to do special permissions on it. For example, you could create a shared access signature key that is only available for reading data, uh, or you can create a, a, an expiration on it. Like all shared access signature keys so you have better control over who has access to your, to your data and how you have access to your data. And it's only at the container level. So you, uh, a shared access signature key can only be used to access the container that it was specified for. You can get this um, by having 
you know, either writing your own tool or using a third-party tool to generate it from the REST API. Unfortunately, right now, you can't directly create a SaaS key from the portal, okay. so you'll have to use one of these third-party tools. Um, but all of these tools, they do the same thing. The SaaS key is actually generated by Windows Azure itself, and these tools just call into the REST API that Windows Azure provides to generate the SaaS key on your behalf, and then you can then access the SaaS key. Okay. So you ha you will. It's a good point. You will have to use one of these tools, however, to create the SaaS key so that you can use this feature. Um, you can't use the regular shared signature, uh, the shared um, storage key that you get through the portal. That one is uh, too high level and it's too, uh, it gives you too much permission. So you actually have to use one of these third-party tools to actually get um, uh, get this key. Okay. All right. So you have to use the shared access signature key to to run this thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And that's primarily, again, for security reasons, because we only want to have um, you know, the SQL Server instance be able to access that one container. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have access to your entire storage account. And we also want to make sure that if you want to provision multiple SQL Server instances using the same storage account, you can give them a degree of isolation by giving them separate SAS keys and separate containers so that they can't actually access each other. And you know, um, it, it gives you an extra level of protection for your data. OK, awesome. Cool. So with this created, we can now create a database. Um, so you can see here, the only change to the create database syntax is actually on the URL itself. So the URL has been changed um, to be the uh, storage account, and the container itself is called SQL Pass. And before I actually create it, let me first show you what it looks like. So in Management Studios, we provided this Azure Storage browser. You can see here, I already connected to the Fabricam Store storage account. There is a bunch of containers that are located here. The specific container that we are using is called SQL Pass. And you can see within here, there's currently nothing at all with it. It's totally blank. So this is a way in SQL Server Management Studio to connect to Azure Storage without going through the portal. Exactly. So we build that into Management Studio. Exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so this provides you convenience. So rather than having to switch into using you know, your browser, mm -hmm. then logging into the portal and viewing it, right. you can just go from one place here and uh, view all of your, you know, your blobs and your data files and such forth. Right. And I if assume you that you get the same view here and then the Azure portal. Exactly, right? okay. yeah, exactly. So let's go ahead and create this database file now. It takes a little bit of time. It's communicating over the REST API to the Windows Azure and running. Um, and it's, uh, what it's doing now is, is actually creating the blobs. So it creates two blobs on Windows Azure Storage. It creates both a, you know, it creates the traditional database blob, uh, database file, which is stored as a blob. And then it creates the log file, which is also stored as a blob on it. See, so it completed successfully. So if we go back here and refresh and reopen these containers, Reopen SQL Pass, you now see we actually have these two files that are now located on Azure Storage. Let's see what it looks like to SQL Server. So I'll just do a basic query from the uh, master files list. So you can see the existing databases that we have on the system. There's a bunch of files on here. Uh, so you have the master database, tempdb, and you can look at this new database that we created, foo. Uh, it looks the same pretty much as any other ones, except when you get the physical name you'll see that it now contains the path to the Windows Azure storage account that we have. And it also has a credential ID. This lets you know which credential has been used to access this, so that in the future, if you need to reference it, if you need to change it, you can go here and look at it and then match it back to the credential that you used. So you treat it as if it's a local database? Exactly. Just like before, it's just now pointing to Azure. Exactly, right. exactly. So oh. for all intents and purposes, it looks just like any other database. Mm -hmm. it, it looks as if it's just any other uh, you know, local, locally stored database. Mm -hmm. So all the operations that we can do with the database, it should work exactly the same here. Exactly right. In fact, let's go ahead and let's actually use this database, okay. and let's create um, some data in it. Let's put some data into it. So let's switch to using this database. And I'm going to create a table that just create, contains some information. So let's say this is like some customer table that you're storing with customer information. So just insert some data, and let's select from it. So as you can see, it's just like any other, any other database. But let me show you the power of actually using data files in Windows Azure. Let me now detach this database. And let me show you how easy it is to actually have the exact same data running in a totally separate instance. So let me switch back to master and detach this. And you can see here 
that the, that the database is no longer on this system. It's so what happened to the files? The files, they're still stored on, on Windows Azure storage, and they're okay. still there. In fact, let me show you this. Let me now switch to a different machine. So I have a second SQL Server instance that's already set up and running. You can see here that um, this does not have any of the credential created. This does not have... This does not have the uh, database created either. So you can see here the database has not been on here. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to do again is recreate that credential with that SAS key. The exact same SAS key. It has to be exact same SAS key because it's basically the exact same access information. And at this point, now let's, uh, let, now let's attach that database that we just created on Windows Azure Storage. So you can see again, it's the exact same syntax. The only difference is the location, again, of the files. And lastly, we're now specifying for attach this time. So let's go ahead and attach that. And in this case, this is now going, uh, one of the things that it's doing is it's acquiring a lease. So each of the files on Windows Azure Storage has this concept of a storage lease or a blob lease. Uh, what this means is that when, the, when one application or one system has acquired the lease, nobody else can actually touch or modify those files. This primarily is actually just for transactional uh, reliability so that you don't accidentally have multiple processes trying to modify these files at the same time. But it also gives you a level of, of security because you know, nobody else can be maliciously modifying your database files while it's being attached to your system because we do, SQL Server does, in fact, acquire a lease on top of it as well, too. So this is like very similar to the file system that we have on right. Windows? Right, right have a lock on the file. Have exactly, it. yeah. That's probably the best way to think about it. Yeah. It's actually just like acquiring a file lock on a local system mm -hmm. so that no other process can actually be accessing that file at the same time. Okay, awesome. So we have that uh, file attached now. Uh, we have that database attached now. So you, if you see here, uh, you can actually see Foo has now been attached to the system. It's actually now up and running. And it's on different SQL Server instances. It's on a totally separate SQL Server instance. And in fact, let's show you that all that data is still there. Let's use that database again. And you can see this is the data that we just previously inserted. It's all back up and running. And on the second instance as well, too, um, you know, this is the same view as you had before of the storage. And of course, it can also see the files. Nothing changed. It was always there. It was always up and running. Um, there's some more advanced stuff that you can do here. Uh, you can enable, like we mentioned, transparent data encryption. Mm -hmm. um, so at, this, at any point, you can actually have just created a certificate here, enable transparent da database encryption, and then turn on encryption as well, too. So anything that you're running, anything that you're storing will be stored uh, all encrypted into the system itself. You don't have to worry about it, and there's nothing else that you need to do. This gives you, you know, a lot of flexibility and power. There's a number of scenarios where you can actually use this sort of thing. Mm. You know, for example, one of the other things that you can do with this flexibility is if you had some sort of, um, you know, back-end office where you're running, you know, you, where you have your main data storage, you're maintaining the data, and you have maybe branch offices. So let's say you have smaller branch offices or maybe even uh, Salesforce, a Salesforce or salespeople who are traveling mm -hmm. and they need access to the data. Well, all of your data can be centrally managed and centrally stored and kept up to date and administrated directly from your you know, back end location, your central location. And then as needed, these branch offices or these traveling salespeople, they can fire up the SQL Server instance and all they have to do is they just have to attach their database. Like I showed here, they just have to attach these databases from the cloud and they instantly have have access to the latest information, to all the latest um, you know updates, whatever ha you know whatever changes that you made in the back end to keep it consistent and current. They have immediate access to all of that, and they don't have to worry about managing any of it. All they have to do is attach it and start using it, and you're good to go. Okay. So you know this gives you a lot of flexibility. This gives you a lot of power, um, and you can even come up with uh, other interesting ways to play with it. Like for example, let's say you have a database that you know has some enterprise level features, but you don't need to use those enterprise features all the time. Maybe you only need to use it like an hour out of the day, and then the rest of the time you just need to use maybe standard level features. Well, you can play with it in Windows Azure, for example, by creating like a enterprise instance, only attach this database to that enterprise instance as you need it, 
mm. and then shut down that enterprise instance, and then reattach that database to a standard instance or something else so that you can continue using that data and not have to worry about having to pay extra money for the enterprise, um, enterprise costs if you, don't need the, if you don't need that SKU and if you don't need that um, functionality. Wow, this is very interesting because now you can actually use multiple versions, multiple editions of SQL Server attaching to the same data files. Right, or right. It works across different editions as well. Right, exactly, right. exactly. Um, I do have a question on the transparent data encryption. Sure. So if I uh, turn, it, uh, turn on data encryption on one, save my certificate or my key on-prem, uh, when I want to attach again, does it mean that I have to restore the key back and things like that? What's the process there? Yeah, you're exactly correct. Um, so transparent mm -hmm. data encryption, of course, provides you with an additional level of security because you know you need to actually have that same information, that same certificate, in order to be able to access that data on your second instance. So in this case, if you were to set up two instances with transparent data encryption, what you would need to do on the second instance is, and this is you know similar to how you would normally do it, even without uh, data files or Windows Azure storage, you would have to have the exact certificate that you created on your first instance, export that certificate, copy it over to your second instance, restore it on your second instance, and then you'll be able to access that database. Because what happens is, you know, you'll be able to use, you'll be able to, you know, physically access those files because you have the SAS key, but the second instance won't be able to decrypt that data until you actually have that certificate on there. So once you have the certificate on there, it'll be able to decrypt it and it'll be able to run as normal. But it's something that you definitely have to be careful of and make sure you are using the same certificate in both places to get access to that data. Okay. Uh, um, one uh, final question that I have is, um, in the previous slide, you talked about the delayed durability, uh, things like that. Can you talk about why we want to have that um, available for this? Sure, sure. Yeah. Let, me switch, uh, let me switch back to that. Mm -hmm. There are actually uh, two interesting features that you can use with data files in Windows Azure. And it kind of goes to your point, too. You know, what about that, mm -hmm. uh, connectation? Uh, what about that connectivity latency? Mm -hmm. What about performance? Right. Uh, so there's two features you can use to actually help uh, mitigate some of the performance issues that you might experience. The first one is delayed durability. So delayed durability is a new feature in SQL Server 2014. And what this does is it postpones some of your log writes. So when you make a you know, transaction to the database, typically what happens is we wait for that transaction to what we call harden. This means that that transaction is fully committed to the log. And even if that server were to crash, we'd be, we, we would be able to recover from it. With delayed durability, if you have certain workloads that are not particularly sensitive to having you know, the exact reliable information or the exact information, and you're, you're OK with some potential data loss, what delayed durability does is when you, write, when you perform a transaction, it'll immediately return from that transaction without that transaction hardening. That means that that transaction may or may not have been written to the log file. So if there was a crash, for example, you may actually lose that transaction. But what this allows you to do is you no longer have to wait for that write. To, you don't have to wait for that write to the log to complete for that transaction itself to complete. So this allows transactions to go much more quickly. And it, re it significantly reduces your write latency, which is, again, you know, one of your potential concerns with using um, data files in Azure, because otherwise you would be waiting for that whole round trip. That write would occur, the transaction would, would be committed, it would be written to the log, and then the transaction would return. Right. So with the late durability, you don't have to wait for all of that. It just comes back. And so you can mitigate some of the write latencies that you might experience with delayed durability. Again, this is only for workloads that you feel um, you might not need to have, you know, that you're okay with losing some, with potentially losing some of the transactions. Um, and so if those workloads, if you have those workloads, then this is a great candidate for using them both together. Okay. Awesome. Um, um, how, the about, other, how about the other one? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the column other feature, store. Column yeah. store. Column store index is also uh, another new feature. Um, this lets you actually have a lot of your index in memory. So with this feature, you actually don't even need to go and do that round trip to Windows Azure Storage at all. So this actually saves a lot of uh, potential latency because you actually have all of your data loaded in memory. Mm. Uh, and then any additional queries that you do against it are done, of course, against your in-memory index. So and you don't touch the disk at all. Exactly, so. exactly. So you don't have to pay for any of that network latency. You don't have to pay for, you don't have to wait for any of that uh, read. You don't have to, you don't have to wait for um, any, uh, 
you know, uh, connection drop issues or anything like that. It can be very powerful when combined with data files and Windows Azure storage because you know you have the you have the power of having you know multiple terabytes of data stored in Windows Azure storage, but you have relatively quick performance because you have your um, you know all of your data, your index being written from being read from memory, so your queries can run very quickly as well too. I see. Plus. Data warehouse um, data usually is not updated very frequently, maybe like once or twice a day in right. a batch format. Right. And this will assure that we don't actually read a lot from the disk directly. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly true. Yeah. This really lets us play to the strength of mm -hmm. both features. Mm -hmm. You know, um, with uh, data files in Windows as, as your storage, you can store like all these large data files, all the data warehouse files directly in it. And it, it, you know, the best is when you don't have to access it that frequently, so you don't have to worry about that much network performance, which is really great with a lot of the data warehouse scenarios where mm -hmm. you actually are not doing a lot of updates on a regular basis, and it primarily is like a read workload. You know, which case, you know, data files in Windows Azure Storage uh, provides you a lot of benefit to using both of these features together with that specific workload. Okay, wow, awesome. Well, thanks for all this discussion. Um, and this is a great feature that I think that people can leverage. And I hope that um, you get good understanding of what this thing can do or cannot do. And it will probably fit with a lot of the scenarios that will help our customers, uh, viewers in the, at home. Uh, thank you so much, Sang, uh, for today, for your session. And um, we're going to take uh, about an hour uh, meal break from here from now on. Uh, we'll be back here for another session uh, with um, SQL Server 2014. Thank you.